About 35 years ago, I moved from um, Bangladesh to the United States to go to college. And as I was researching about universities and colleges, I noticed that not all the good schools are in Washington, D.C., which was a little surprising to me because uh, in, back in Bangladesh, most good schools were in Dhaka, its capital city. Uh, Matt, you have been there, so you know. Um, so over time, I realized that uh, this is actually a very uh, consistent pattern that developing countries generally have uh, all the facilities concentrated in the main capital city, whereas uh, in developed countries, things are more dispersed. So I, of course, try to see the connection between concentration of resources and stagnation and dispersion with progress. Uh, just to illustrate that point, let me show you an extreme case, uh, Korea, uh, North Korea and South Korea. In, this is just a photograph from the sky on uh, electrical activities in the evening. Uh, South Korea, as you can see, is there's a dispersion of activities, and North Korea is pretty much dark. But the important point is that North Korea does have electricity. It has, uh, it's in one town, Pyongyang, but in South Korea, it's all over the place. And we, of course, know the economic and political stagnation of North Korea and, um, and the reverse in South Korea. So the point is, this is just an extreme case, uh, just to make the point, but um, developing countries in general have this problem. Uh, so, so basically, um, I started reading history, and I realized that the story of Western progress was really the story of dispersion of power. And that has influenced me in my thinking, and which ultimately led to Grameen Phone. So, of course, in front of me, I could see that we, again, many of you are young, you may not know, but there were uh, such a thing called mainframes when I was in university. And this used to be a huge computer and uh, used to be in a very cold room. And some of us were somehow connected to it through uh, various uh, monitors. But eventually, because, uh, which we all know, Moore's Law, that I will also touch upon, we, this led to uh, personal computers, and a lot of people got active. And we all know, through that, how uh, not only computing power got dispersed, but lots of creativity and productivity and opportunity emerged from that dispersion. Another interesting thing about this phenomena, again, to understand what happens in poor countries, is to see a little analogy also. But poor countries are generally run by the government. It's like the mainframe. And, poor, and rich countries, are, uh, productivity goes through entrepreneurs, businesses, a lot of little dispersed activities. And that's like the PCs. So imagine going back to the mainframe time countries would naturally uh, stagnate. I mean, all this productivity and creativity would be discarded. And that's what was really troubling, in my mind, uh, uh, poor countries in general, because they were being run by a mainframe, namely the government, as opposed to entrepreneurs and uh, various kinds of creative people making things happen. So I'm just using that as an analogy also to help you understand what I thought was the problem in poor countries, and again, how we can change that. So again, if we go back to history, we can see for hundreds of years, various kinds of technologies have dispersed power. And it could be right here in England, water mills, windmills, eyeglasses, iron plows. This goes back 1,000 years, but this is, here too, there was concentration of power monarchies and whatnot, but it slowly got dispersed, and citizens became more powerful. They were able to bargain with the authorities and create checks and balances. That's what led to progress. Um, 
And again, this is a story that's uh, generally in the history books, and this is just an example. David Landis, who taught at Harvard for 45 years, he uh, talks about it in his book. And overall, the summary is citizens got empowered economically, and governments came down from, from their high horses. And that's what that flattened the hierarchies, and again, power got dispersed, progress happened. If you look at that, then you can see what happened in poor countries uh, for various geopolitical reasons. Poor countries' governments were given aid, so it actually hardened the hierarchies. As opposed to dispersing power, we concentrated power, gave rise to stagnation, statism, corruption, all sorts of problems. So as the, um, the Moore's Law was unfolding in front of me in, during my university days and subsequently, I could see that that's a tremendous force of, innovate, of dispersion of power. In this case, I'm showing mainframe to PCs to cell phones, for instance. Again, the Moore's Law, I'm sure all of you know, but um, what was remarkable, of course, he said something more complicated, but it boiled down to that every 18 months, computer power, I mean, the price of the same computing power goes down by 50%. That's actually quite remarkable because that means every three years, it goes down to a quarter. Every six years, it goes to one over 16. And every 12 years, it goes to 1 over 256. Uh, by the way, I'm at MIT, so I have to be very good with this kind of math. And then every 15 years, almost $1,000 worth of microchips become $1. And so I felt this is really something developing countries should harness. And uh, of course, people couldn't quite use computers because uh, many, of, uh, cit many citizens in poor countries are typically illiterate, so uh, it's not quite something I could do about how to put computers into use. But then I realized that mobile phones, as we are talking about today, is actually the device to utilize the Moore's Law in favor of developing countries. Um, so in 1993, by this time, I managed to become um, at least a young investment banker. And uh, four or five of us were connected by a very rudimentary um, network in my office. And we simply became more productive. Because uh, in these, um, again, many of you may not know, there were such a thing called floppy disks. And we would exchange those things and update each other and become more productive. And as this wiring was done, uh, we didn't have to do that. We became more productive. And one of these days, it broke down, and I, I, um, I was waiting for someone to come and fix it. And as I was not getting things done, it reminded me of a day in 1971 when Bangladesh was going through a war. And this is the war that separated. Uh, Bangladesh used to be East Pakistan. And this is the war that separated Bangladesh from uh, West, what was then West Pakistan and now Pakistan. And through that, well, there was a lot of violence in the urban areas, uh, and my family moved to a remote rural setting, and uh, just to be a little bit in peace. But uh, one time, my mother asked me to get some medicine for a younger sibling um, some 10 kilometers away. So I walked all morning to get there, but when I got there, because there were no telephones, so I, um, when I got there, then I learned that um, the medicine man isn't there. He has gone to get his supplies. And um, so I simply didn't get anything done. I walked back all afternoon. And as I was sitting in New York uh, in a tall building I, um, and having an unproductive day, I remembered another unproductive day some 20 years earlier. And I realized that connectivity is productivity, whether it's in a modern office or an underdeveloped uh, village. And uh, again, I'm talking about the Stone Age, so people don't realize that I had to argue a lot 
to explain that telephones are a productivity tools. Okay. That's understood now, but it was not so understood in those days, almost 20 years ago. And uh, the people would say, no, a poor country needs, uh, they don't need telephones. There are many other basic needs. There are, and you know, once you get richer, then you get, uh, then you get more telephones. But my basic point was that if you get telephones, you'll get richer, the reverse of that. Okay. Um, so let me go through that little uh, logic, and you'll see uh, what I mean. But again, the first thing I did, I tried to check how many telephones did we have in the country. And there were one out of 500 people had a telephone. Okay? And of those one out of 500, were all in the, mostly all, 70% of them, were in the capital city, 70 or 67% or something. And um, so again, it's the concentration of resources. That's what I've been talking about. And so I felt I, you know, 100 million people in the rural areas did not have a telephone, none, literally. Okay. So I felt you know, the economics of Moore's law and all that is changing, so there ought to be a way to fix this problem. Okay. So uh, I'll go through some of the um, logical steps, but most people told me that um, you, know, you need uh, a telephone once you get rich. But then I said, no, of course. If you, have, if you have a telephone, people will make more money and then they will be able to pay. So for instance, in here, or at least in the United States, we, you could put a little bit of money down to get a car. And the car takes you to work, the work pays you a salary, and you use the salary to pay off the loan for the car. So the car actually pays for itself. So the point was, even if people don't have the money, they can always get a phone, and over time, they become more productive, and they can pay for the, for the phone. Second, um, people told me that, um, yes, but you really, whether what you have access to depends on your purchasing power. Even that problem can be solved by having a shared access situation. So for instance, in this country, uh, most people need banking services, but very, of, very few of us are trying to buy a bank to get the banking service. So uh, someone buys a bank, and then the whole community can get a banking service. Uh, or people told me that um, basic needs needs to be met. People don't have enough food, enough clothing, enough shelter. Those are more fundamental needs. Why mobile phones? Okay. But again, if people's productivity go up, then they can use what, uh, what is necessary for them. So one of the fundamental problems for developing countries is that people think they are resource poor. And they often ignore that, that those countries are actually very, very wasteful. So for instance, I started thinking how time was being wasted. And therefore, if you have telephones, people would not waste time. You know, after all, a person in London has 24 hours a day. The person in Bangladesh also has 24 hours a day. It's a resource that's equal. You just get more done here because we have all sorts of devices. And similarly, another important resource that's wasted are people's brains. You know, one thing good about it is that it's democratically distributed. Everybody has one. Nobody has two brains. Nobody has zero. And so even those brains are being, not being utilized unless they have income. So the point I'm making is that's another important resource that's wasted unless people have income. So the productivity of people changes all of that. And suddenly, all sorts of brains get to be utilized. Their hands, legs, everything else attached to the brain also gets utilized. So the real problem that got on my way is the concentration of resources. Namely, if you have everything in one capital city, let's say in London, then how would you take these services further out? Okay. The, that's why I started looking at these microcredit organizations. There were several microcredit organizations. Grameen Bank was the most famous. But the, because you need something to piggyback on. So for instance, in the early 90s, I noticed that the internet was spreading very fast in the US. And that's because people already had other things. They had 
computers, maybe not as widespread as it now. They had, um, many people may not know, there is such a thing called modems. There used to be, um, there were telephone lines, okay. All sorts of other infrastructures existed through which a new thing can ride quickly and spread. But in poor countries, that's what's lacking. That's why I'm talking about, let's say, outside the capital city. All those things aren't there. So, and that's precisely where I wanted to go to, to kind of end the vicious cycle. Because, because you don't have those infrastructures there, you, if, you cannot take it, any new technology there any, uh, anymore. And then it simply exacerbates the real problem, same problem. So I wanted to kind of kill that vicious cycle and this is why I started looking at microcredit organizations. And um, for example, Grameen Bank had 1,000 branches, was serving some 2 million people, and they were m lending money, mostly to women. That's because they found that women manage money better. So I started looking at how, uh, how can I dovetail my idea with theirs? And I first thought maybe there should be a um, client. And then I already have, they have 1,000 branches to manage. And they could uh, become more efficient. And I have a big client, and on I go. But they were not that interested in it, because after all, this is a country that didn't have telephones, really. And so um, they didn't want to rock the boat. They're already doing fine, in kind of a decentralized way. Each branches were sort of managing themselves, and they didn't want to suddenly think about a new technology. So I tried to see how can I dovetail uh, what is it they have. And so I looked at their main, main um, product, which is they give loans for, to people for starting to grow vegetables or goats or ducks or chicken. But a cow loan was a typical loan. Uh, somebody could borrow $200, buy a cow. The cow gives milk, and she sells the milk in the village and pays off the loan. And a year later, she kind of bootstraps herself. So my logic was that perhaps a cell phone can be a cow. Um, you know, it, somebody could borrow some money, start selling some mobile phone service in the community, because it's like the bank. You don't have to buy the bank to get your banking services. Let somebody buy it, and the whole community can get a um, banking service, and it's a business for you. So I went back to the um, bank, and I said, look, I think cell phone can be a cow, too. And um, they said, this is a little uh, crazy, but it's um, somewhat logical. So they said, if, it is, can be ha if you think this can be made to happen, then come and do it. So I quit my job in America, and I created a company called Gonophone, which in Bengali means phones for the masses, and which is a little crazy because cell phones were actually not for the masses, at least in the United States. They were like 1% or 2% Americans had it. But I believed in the Moore's Law, that if $1,000 of the microchips become $1 15 years later, then it'll become possible. It'll become cheaper. And of course, you don't necessarily see your cell phones getting cheaper and cheaper because it's getting more powerful. You're able to do a lot more things, like what Matt was showing, all sorts of things. It's even more than a PC, okay? So all of that would make it easier for people who are quote unquote illiterate could use these things and may be so user friendly. So the, anyway, the bottom line is, I, after several years of, uh, of work and a lot of sleepless nights, some minor loss of hair, I did create a company um, called Grameen Phone, which uh, Grameen Bank became a partner, and the Norwegian telephone company also took a majority stake. And I flew some million miles. But anyway, it's got going, and uh, now we have 22 million subscribers. Uh, there are 250,000 people who retail these telephone services in the villages. And 100 million people have access. And the, there are other mobile phone operators 
there are actually more than 50 million phones now. And actually, the number of phones in the country has multiplied by more than 100 times in 15 years. Um, these are some old data, but by now, I think the company has invested some $3 billion. But the interesting thing is, I, of course, organized it in a way expecting this to happen. But frankly, mobile phones have spread all over the poor, poor world. Okay. And that's an interesting question to ask. Why is that the case? There are lots of places where there is not enough water, portable water, electricity. All sorts of basic needs aren't there. But somehow, mobile phones are all over the world. And of course, I did not foresee the technology called prepaid cards. That's why I was organizing it in this village-based retailing arrangement. But that technology has kind of obviated that need. So um, mobile phones have spread all over Africa, all Asian countries, Latin America, and other countries. But why is it so? You know, there are efforts where people are trying to distribute um, personal computers, even free, through and in a charitable means. But that's not quite working. But mobile phones are spreading. Even in Afghanistan, a quarter of the adult population have cell phones. Iraq, all these God-forsaken countries, there is these cell phones are spreading in Congo. Okay, why so? And I think that also explains, I mean, billions of dollars are being invested in these countries, building up these towers, building up the network. The reason is, in my mind, it's a productivity tool, and that's what minimizes waste and, and minimizes uh, and increases opportunities. So people are able to produce something, so they can get a dollar ahead, and they can spend pennies to the phone company and build. So as a result, those, those pennies add up to billions of dollars. So companies can build the infrastructure. So at the end of the day, it's something that hits people's pocketbook right away. Because by saving a bus ride or you know, not wasting a day, the day I wasted in a village in Bangladesh, uh, if, I mean, luckily, I was, I was a child, so I didn't, maybe my lack of productivity didn't matter too much. But an adult, let's say a fisherman, not fishing that day is a total waste. So all that increased productivity helps the person pay for the service, and all those little payments can add up to billions of dollars, which is why big companies are investing in these infrastructures. Um, so, of course, there are a lot of innovations happening in the first world and that are spreading to the third world. But another interesting phenomenon going on, uh, in fact, the mobile phone is an example of that, but interesting phenomena going on is the possibilities and actually happening, the reverse innovations. And I want to touch upon that a little bit uh, because you can see that the mobile, the voice communication at the end of the day was just a killer app. Um, it's like maybe people used um, lighting, electricity for lighting initially, but eventually lighting, electricity got used in so many ways. Okay. So the voice communication, that was a productivity thing. And actually it was egalitarian because everybody talks, not everybody writes. So. Um, that's what helped the spread of mobile phones. But at the end of the day, they're very, very powerful computers. I mean, the mobile phone today uh, is more powerful than the computer that took man to moon in 1969. Much more, thousands of times more powerful in terms of computing power. So, and they're connected. So yes, one interesting killer app, namely voice communication, have helped it spread but all sorts of other things can be now piggybacking on that mobile phone. Just like I piggybacked on microcredit to spread the phones, the phones that in themselves can be a means through which other applications can spread. And uh, among other things, like what um, Matt was saying, you know, I just got some data on these bricky countries, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, Indonesia, large countries. 
In general, mobile phones are already in these countries four times bigger than uh, the penetration of computers. So, also, so just not only because the, there's a large population, but also mobile telephony, mobile phones are much bigger population than computers. So I think there would be a lot of you know, reverse innovations will take place in, um, um, from developing countries. By the way, um, MIT is located uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And one of our local magazines were talking about this research. Uh, I mean, GE is creating innovations first in India and China, and then bringing it to the first world. Because if they don't do that, then um, it's some other, their competition could be doing that and could be producing a much cheaper product, and, and they would beat a GE. So, because of lower purchasing power in developing countries, many companies are, are now looking into the possibilities of innovating in poor countries and then bringing it here, which is kind of the reverse of what used to be the case. A product was exhausted here and then took it to those countries. But these research, this, um, reverse innovations are happening. I show you an example. Of course, mobile money is an example where there was a long um, Tony Page article in The Economist that how uh, that's happening in poor countries in Kenya, in the Philippines, and actually spreading all over the developing world. And that could also become a commonplace here. Sometimes because in the developed countries we already have good banking systems and other things, we don't quite see the need for it. In poor countries that's not the case, so they see it before we do. So that's another thing, factor that would contribute to reverse innovations. In fact, here's an example. Last week's uh, Economist is talking about a company called M Pedigree that detects uh, the fake medicines, and uh, that's another. Uh, and the the Economist article also talks about how uh, that problem is a real problem in the first world as well. So here's an example of a mobile application in um, that's coming back from the developing countries to the developed ones. And uh, so let me also introduce to you the center I founded three years ago at MIT, which simply because of the dispersion of power needs I am talking about, we created a center for bottom-up entrepreneurship in developing countries. MIT has a lot of innovations, and some of those innovations could be utilized to create enterprises in developing countries. And um, this center gives fellowships to MIT students who create all sorts of uh, ideas and pursues uh, their entrepreneurial drive. And just talking about mobile telephony, just to give you an example, this year we have 35 fellows, and 11 of them are working on mobile technology. Others are working on energy, on agriculture, other things. And many different areas of the mobile telephony is being applied to for look for a job, logistical things, transactions, banking, education, all sorts of things. Because again, they're powerful computers. As long as you um, make people productive out of it, then you have the, they have automatically have the purchasing power and they can, um, you have more business. So the more productive your customer is, the more business you have. So it's actually a win-win-win situation. Namely, um, citizens and normal people can become more productive through such tools. Someone can have a business selling the tools, and these economies lift up. Now, because these countries are, are um, econo I mean, low income, that's why I feel it's important to keep this in mind, that if you pe make people more productive, then you have more business, and it's a win-win arrangement. So thank you, I would end there. That was absolutely fascinating, Iqbal. Thank, thank you very much. Does anybody like to ask a question? We have a couple of dispersed microphones <laughs> to empower uh, the people in the audience, so if anybody would like to, to raise a question. Perhaps I could get the ball rolling while you um, uh, just reflect on that for a minute. I, I thought, I mean, fascinating uh, talk. What is it like when you look at you know, with your thought of reverse innovation, when you look at countries like the UK and the US, 
through the lens of your experience in Bangladesh? What do you see there that's, that you think is interesting and important? Uh, well, I, I see the UK and the US at the, at the same level, and so I don't, at least between those two, I don't consider you know, reverse or one way or the other. And I just think there is, of course, a lot of uh, social media and all sorts of other activities going on, and even there, really, um, people, are, people find an application useful because it's advancing their lives in some ways. Mm -hmm. But we may not see it as much as, in my language, that's making you more productive because there's enough income in people. So, but at the end of the day, people have limited time. So unless something is making you more productive, you don't quite use that, you don't quite pursue that. First of all, the internet is available through the phone, okay. But also there is WiMAX services and other things are emerging. Uh, you know, in America we have uh, light squared, which is like you were saying, the 66 times more traffic would go, uh, would happen. By the way, connectivity is productivity, but because people are seeking productivity, they are trying to be connected, okay. Uh, so. There, it, these things are emerging slightly slower, but it's happening, okay? And so I think there is a lot of opportunities, but especially I also think that these, the, it is so successful that mobile phone operators, frankly, are new monsters in town. They're very big, and compared to the rest of the economy, uh, they are very, very powerful, which I don't think, at the end of the day, very healthy, okay? So even though I may take credit or blame for creating one, but I, I, I think that's not good for this country. So there needs to be more competition. So what I think is a good thing to think about is other IP providers through WiMAX or Light Squared in the US, similar things. And then if you can switch to uh, like Skype or other things that you could bypass uh, the mobile phone operators, because this is a computer, a very powerful one, uh, then uh, they would feel pressure. And at the end of the day, the competitive pressure is good for these companies, but also good for society at large. So I hope that all this computing power, because Moore's law lives on, and it's, the power is doubling, so we should make use of it in terms of even bypassing. Bypassing has been a key to progress, by the way. That's what's the key to dispersion of power. There are a lot of, like for example, there's another company, at least in Bangladesh, called Cell Bazaar, which is a, a eBay sort of thing, eBay or Craigslist on the cell phones. So all sorts of other products can emerge through, um, through the mobile phone. So if you have another product, be it um, education, or that's what I was talk showing that how some of our students are working on. Um, and I think there are fantastic possibilities because again, uh, mobile phone have penetrated a lot more and as you expect, um, than the computers. So we really should see this as a very powerful connected computer that's, um, happens to have spread through voice communication. Mm -hmm. So anything is possible, really, yeah. And so can I ask you a, uh, maybe a closing question? Uh, what's your favorite app on a mobile phone, personally? Um, personally, I think uh, email is one. And the other is that whenever I need to use the internet, I have the cell phone in my pocket. So for example, yesterday, I came from Boston. I didn't bring my laptop because I have one of the smartphones, and that's uh, good enough. Right, so yeah. it's not only saving you time and brain power, it's also sa saving you hand luggage. Hand luggage, and you don't have to go through the yeah. difficulties of checking and everything. Okay. Yeah. Iqbal, thank you very much. Fascinating talk. Thank, thank you for joining you. us. Thank you.